Okay, so now that we know what a local potential and what an action potential are, we have to talk about, and we know basically how to initiate that action potential through the use of the local potential there at the trigger zone or action hillock, we need to learn how to move that action potential down the length of a neuron. This is going to be called conducting an action potential. Now, there are two main types of neurons that we're going to conduct action potentials down. Those that don't have the myelin sheath and those that do have a myelin sheath. <clears throat> those that do not have an, a myelin sheath, we're going to call unmyelinated fibers. <clears throat> so, unmyelinated fibers. The unmyelinated fiber, remember, myelin was a, um, a form of insulation that gets put around the axon of the neuron. In the unmyelinated fiber that does not have that myelin sheath, the entire length of the membrane is covered with ion channels. So from the axon hillock all the way down to the axon terminals, we're going to have ion channels. In these neurons, when the local potential reaches the trigger zone, we still have an action potential that it's going to form. Okay, so the local potential reaches the trigger zone, the action potential forms. And in that patch of membrane, and that's what you can see illustrated here, we're going to have that sodium. If I sort of blow this up, here's our sodium channel. Sodium's high outside the cell. It's lower inside the cell. We get our stimulus on that patch of the membrane. Sodium crosses. Now we're going to have sodium that moves just a short distance away from that, that point. We'll have the action potential that forms, and sodium moves away. <clears throat> okay, so action potential forms. The sodium moves a short distance. And the membrane that is distal, so this is moving away from the axon hillock, this is more distal. The distal membrane of course will have its ion channels. They're going to be voltage gated. And those voltage gated channels as we move away from the trigger zone are going to be influenced by that sodium that moves a short distance. And they're going to be influenced to open. So the distal membrane, we move a little bit further down the membrane, there's going to be a voltage gated ion channel. That's going to open. The net result here is to have sodium at this point of the membrane to begin to diffuse into the cell and move further down along the membrane. So sodium would become would, would continue to influx in this direction and continue to move further and further down the membrane. And this sequence of events is repeated. over and over again where additional sodium enters the cell and begins to move along the membrane. And it's a chain reaction all the way down to the synapse. Now what this requires is multiple sodium channels all the way down to be influenced by the previous sodium channel. <clears throat> so in order for the action potential to move along the membrane, every ion channel along the way has to be involved. This ends up being a slow speed of conduction. And slow speed, just to give you a reference here, about 2 meters per second. And so that means 50 seconds to go 100 meters. Most of you per can run faster 
than this conductive speed down an unmyelinated fiber. The advantage to this, even though it's slow, which could be a disadvantage in some circumstances, say you put your hand on a hot burner, you don't want to have that signal take, you know, a second or two before it uh, signals your muscle to respond to pull your hand away from that hot burner. Uh, so it's slow, so it shouldn't be used there, but it's non-decremental. And so what that means is we don't lose the signal down the length of the neuron. The other type of fiber that we're going to conduct an action potential down is called a myelinated fiber. Now, the myelinated fiber contains these areas called Schwann cells. This is myelin that gets wrapped around the axon. Underneath those areas, which are known as the internodes, there is a very low ion channel density. So ion channels are scarce below that insulating myelin or in the internodal portions of the membrane. So here in this area, very low concentration or density of ion chains. If you were to take a square micrometer, you would have about 25 individual channels in that square micrometer of membrane. Now we can take this in comparison to the ion channel density within the nodes of Ranvier. In the nodes of Ranvier, the ion channel is very dense. So we have a very dense number or large quantity of ion channels in the nodes of Ranvier. So compare this 25 uh, in 25 ion channels in a square micrometer, that same square micrometer, if we were in the uh, node of Rain VA, we would have 5,000 uh, in that same square micrometer. So very high density of ion channels in the nodes of Rain VA. Now, the action potential is going to begin when sodium enters the axolemma or crosses the axolemma. That's going to be the membrane. Axolemma is the membrane of the axon. So sodium enters, and that's what you can see illustrated here at the axon hillock here at the trigger zone. Sodium begins to enter, crosses uh, through the axon lemma, axial lemma. As that sodium crosses into the cell, the ions diffuse a short distance. travel along the membrane. Now the way that this works, so kind of draw our membrane here, and this would be one side of the axon, here's the other side of the axon, and we would have this would be our inner node right here. So this is a node of RAN VA, here would be another node of RAN VA we might have other inner node right here. And so sodium begins to cross into the cell here. And as each of these sodium molecules crosses, because they have, all have positive charges, they repel each other and they begin to move in this direction. But as we get further and further along the inner node, we get less and less 
numbers of sodium ions. So very dense over here, where we have sodium coming in, and then less and less as we move this way. So the sodium begins to move in this direction, and it's heading towards this next node of Ranvier. So as the sodium crosses in, it is repelled by neighboring sodium, sodium that's crossing in as well. And so the sodium that's already there is going to be pushed in this direction as more sodium enters in. And it kind of acts like, you know, if I have a, a sodium molecule that comes in, it causes this sodium molecule to move in this direction, which causes this sodium molecule here to move in this direction, which causes this sodium molecule here to move in this direction. And so it's kind of like a Newton's cradle, that desk toy uh, with the little balls on the string. You pull one back and it hits the next one and it pushes it further away. And so it's sort of moving along or below the myelin, below that inner node, kind of in a um, bink, 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 bink type movement. Now, the advantage of this cooperative repelling movement is it's very quick. So to move this sodium here in this direction takes a fraction of the time that it would take for the sodium to enter here to cause an action potential, cause another action potential, cause another action potential, cause another action potential. The time that it takes to create those action potentials, we've already moved several sodium down to the next inner node, and then the next inner node in, in this direction, and so on and so forth. So it's very, very quick. Now, even though it's quick, it does, it is subjected to decrement. The myelin itself is going to help to prevent that decrement from being really severe. So even though we are losing the signal as we move and repel the sodium molecules along underneath the myelin, the myelin does insulate it enough where we can maintain a large enough signal by the time we get to the next node of Ranvier to cause voltage-gated sodium channels in that next patch of membrane to open up to allow new sodium to flood into the cell. The myelin prevents this severe decrement because it prevents sodium leakage. So by preventing sodium leakage, sodium doesn't escape back out of the cell in large quantities, and this prevents the extreme weakening of that sodium signal. Another way to say this is it's going to prevent adverse plus and minus to go across the membrane. So we're preventing the loss of sodium to the extracellular fluid and we're preventing the pull of negative ions such as chloride into the intracellular fluid which would both cause changes in the strength of the signal that's being produced as those ions cross underneath the inner node to the next node of Ranvier. Now the reason that myelin can do this is because myelin is thick enough. It's thick enough to prevent uh, uh, oh, large amount of contact or influence between the intracellular fluid, extracellular fluid um, uh, across the membrane. Using this mechanism of myelinated fibers, we can maintain a signal strength where the signal is strong enough for about a one millimeter distance. So it can move that one millimeter distance relatively strong. 
Now this distance is the approximate distance to the next node of RAM VA. So the sodium is strong enough, the signal is maintained strong enough, the sodium moves along the membrane that one millimeter distance, and we make it to the next, uh, uh, the next node of RAN VA, and the signal is strong enough to cause sodium channels to open, and potassium channels to open, and in that small little patch of membrane at the node of RAN VA, we can have an action potential that gets produced. And this process is repeated, and you can see that it takes on this appearance that the sodium jumps from node to node. So the process is repeated from node to node to node. And if we were to look at this and identify where the action potentials are occurring, we're only going to see action potentials being generated along the axon at the nodes of RAN VA. So this gives the apparent appearance of action potentials occurring every millimeter or so. And so it has been described or said that the action potential leaps down the neuron from node to node. And this type of conduction where we have an action potential that occurs here, action potential that occurs here, and action potential that occurs here as we travel down the neuron. called saltatory conduction. Now you'll remember that <clears throat> our unmyelinated fiber exhibited conduction speeds of about 2 meters per second. <clears throat> Using the myelinated fiber in this saltatory conduction, the speeds that we can achieve in these neurons is about 120 meters per second which is super fast. So now we're talking about a meter <coughs> long neuron. We can move a signal down that in one, one, one one hundred and twentieth of a second. <clears throat> All right, so once we've conducted our signal from the axon hillock down to the end of the axon, whether it's a myelinated or an unmyelinated, unmyelinated or myelinated fiber, we're going to eventually get down to the very end of the neuron. And the end of a neuron, it forms this thing called the terminal arborization, and these basically are little um, branches that extend off and end at a synapse or a synaptic knob or a synaptic button. And it is in the synapse where the neuron is going to connect to other nervous tissue or other types of tissue such as muscles, glands, etc. So we're going to talk a little bit about the synapse. And to really understand what's going on here, at the synapse, the action potential which is an electrical signal, right? It's an exchange of charged particles, is going to reach the nerve ending. So at the end of the nerve, we have the synapse, and our electrical signal reaches this synapse, and it triggers an event. And really, the question becomes how? We have a charge based on electrical signal that is now going to cause chemical things to happen or pressure things to happen or uh, the contraction of muscle. And so how are we going to take that 
electrical signal of the action potential, the exchange of sodium and potassium, and convert it into the chemical information or the pressure information that is going to facilitate physiological function or represent physiological function. Now again, we can have interaction between the neuron and other types of tissue. Lots of times it will be neuron to another neuron. And so in a synapse where it's a neuron attached to another neuron, okay, so we have two nerves or two neurons that are involved at that synapse. We can define this relationship between the two neurons as a presynaptic neuron and as a postsynaptic neuron. So we'll have our synaptic knob, and then really the synapse is that gap that exists. And we'll have potentially another, it might be a dendrite or part of the soma or part of the axon or whatever. And we're going to have this, this area here where we have this synapse that exists. And so we would have a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. Now, I said that it could be the dendrite, or it could be the axon, or it could be the soma. These are all different kinds of neuron-to-neuron -neuron synapses. So here you can see we have a couple individual three different neurons here. Here's one of our neurons. Here's a second neuron. We can actually see that there are some uh, uh, axon terminals here from another neuron that we can't see the rest of. Here's just the soma and the dendrites of a fourth neuron. And these all illustrate the different types of neuron-to-neuron -neuron synapses that can exist. So if the synapse is attached up to the dendrite of a, another neuron. We call that an axodendritic synapse. And the presynaptic neuron is interfaced to the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, or, I'm sorry, dendrite, more specifically. The neuron. So interface to the postsynaptic dendrite. The next would be an axosomatic. In this case, we have our presynaptic that is going to interface to the postsynaptic soma or neuron cell body. And then finally, our last is going to be the axo-axonic. In the axo-axonic, the presynaptic neuron is interfaced to the postsynaptic axon. Okay, so you can see here's our axodendritic, so axon to dendrite, our um, this is going to be our axosomatic, axon to soma, and then we can also have um, the axon to the axon of a, another cell. Now, in all reality, individual neurons can have upwards of thousands of synapses in a variety of different places. So they could all be of different types. You might have a bunch of axoaxonic and a bunch of axosomatic and a bunch of axodendritic all attached up to 
the same neuron, all from different neurons, thousands of different neurons. Now, we've also talked about um, neuron to other tissue, and in particular, neuron to skeletal muscle, and we call that the neuromuscular junction. This is another synapse where we have the axon, the synaptic uh, knob of a neuron, interfaced to the muscle cell, to a muscle cell uh, at this thing called the neuromuscular junction, and you have on the muscle side the motor end plane. Uh, so that would be another possible example uh, of neuron to another type of tissue. We've already talked about the neuromuscular junction in some detail. Now, the synapse is a chemical synapse. And what that means is that electrical signal is going to stimulate the release of chemicals into that gap. And this is how ultimately the electrical signal is going to be moved into a, another surrounding cell. So the postsynaptic membrane, if it's a, another neuron or a muscle, is going to respond not to the electrical signal, but to the chemical signal that's produced by that electrical signal of the neuron. So as that signal comes in to the presynaptic neuron, that signal is going to be passed across the synapse, not as an electrical signal, but as a chemical signal through use of what is known as a neural transmitter. A neural transmitter. So to really understand this, we need to sort of revisit some things that we've already talked about with the neuromuscular junction. So we've already really kind of seen some of this before, but we're going to go back over it. We're going to talk a little bit about the synapse anatomy, the anatomy of this gap between a pre- and post-synaptic membrane. So the axon of the neuron forms a synaptic knob. So here in the presynaptic membrane, we have this knob or this bulge that's formed. Inside of that knob, we have this space, and it's filled up with cytosol, but it also contains these vesicles. There's, these vesicles are going to be lipid, uh, bilayer, there are going to be little packets that have some space inside, and in that space there's going to be a molecule or uh, a bunch of molecules. It's a little packet of molecules. So these so called synaptic vesicles are going to be pooled up conglomerated just a short distance from the membrane. So just a short distance from that presynaptic membrane. When the signal comes down the axon and enters the synaptic knob, that signal is going to generate or cause voltage-gated calcium channels to open up. Calcium rushes into the cell. We have an increase in calcium in the presynaptic synaptic knob, or the presynapse knob. This causes those vesicles to translocate from their storage pool down to the synaptic membrane, and we say that they dock. So these are going to be docked vesicles after we increase calcium levels. And the docked vesicle, stimulated by calcium, becomes ready for release of that contained neurotransmitter. So the vesicle comes up, it docks up, and this is a series of molecular and cellular biology that happens here. Basically, there's a host of proteins that help in that docking process, help to open up, form a pore, so that vesicle can release its substance 
out of the vesicle through the membrane into this thing called the synaptic cleft or the synaptic gap. Now, as neurotransmitter levels increase in the synaptic cleft on the postsynapse side, so the postsynaptic tissue, in this case, we're going to call or we're going to refer specifically to a neuron. So this could also be, again, another tissue gland or muscle. Uh, it's a postsynaptic tissue. In this case, we're just going to say postsynaptic neuron. We're going to have the neurotransmitter that is released and interacts in the postsynaptic neuron with a bound receptor. So bound up in the membrane of the postsynaptic cell, we're going to have these receptors. These receptors are going to be able to bind the neurotransmitter transmitter, and they're going to act as ligand gated channels. And that ligand gated channel just simply means that we're not going to have an electrical voltage change that stimulates their opening, but the attachment of you can see blown up here the attachment of the ligand. In, the case, in this case, it's going to be our neurotransmitter. So that neurotransmitter binds up, opens up this receptor, which also acts as a channel, and now we begin to dump some sort of ion, usually it's sodium, into that presynaptic cell. And now we gener regenerate on the presynaptic side of the synapse a electrical signal. So let's talk a little bit more about neurotransmitters. There are a whole host of different types of molecules involved in neurotransmission. These neurotransmitters generally are small carbon containing or organic molecules. So small organic molecules. And we can roughly put these small organic molecules into four categories. So we can have four general categories of neurotransmitters primarily based off of chemical composition. The first category is going to be acetylcholine. This was the neurotransmitter of muscle contraction. We also have neurotransmitters that are amino acids. There are neurotransmitters that are going to be monoamines and catecholamines. Neuropeptides will be our last group of neurotransmitters. So monoamines, catecholamines are a third group, and the neurotransmitters are going to be a fourth group. Now, these neurotransmitters transmitters are going to have a variety or varied effects. And in fact, they're going to have varied effects from specific neurotransmitters. So acetylcholine, acetylcholine is not just going to cause muscle contraction. It's actually also going to change some of the physiology of the heart. And the way that this happens is that we actually are going to have multiple types of receptors that bind individual neurotransmitters, and it's going to be the receptor, not the neurotransmitter, that dictates the effect. So one specific neurotransmitter will be related to and be able to bind to many different types of receptors. And that relationship 
receptors, not the neurotransmitter, will dictate the cellular response. And we'll actually come back and we'll talk more about this, but you can see acetylcholine can bind through what's known as a nicotinic receptor, but also a muscarinic receptor. And then we have norepinephrine and epinephrine, which are also known uh, as uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline, can bind up on beta adrenergic and alpha adrenergic receptors. And they're going to cause different types of responses. The nicotinic receptor would be the type of acetylcholine receptor that we find in uh, skeletal muscle that helps with the skeletal muscle contraction process. Okay, so what happens when a neurotransmitter is released from a neuron? We're going to call that synaptic transmission. Uh, and this is going to lead to, with the help of a receptor, a neurotransmitter's action. The neurotransmitter, its action can be excitatory or inhibitory. Again, depending on the type of receptor that is going to be present. Receptor dependent. So an individual neurotransmitter can be both excitatory and inhibitory depending on what receptor it's working through. Now you can see um, some more specific examples uh, on pages 463 and 465 in the textbook. Here's just one specific example. Um, this would be a cholinergic transmission. This is going to be an excitatory, an excitatory example. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you can see we have uh, several different places where acetylcholine is being released, and that acetylcholine eventually leads to uh, some other areas. Here we have skeletal muscle, our nicotinic receptor, and acetylcholine causing muscle contraction. Here, acetylcholine interacting with the adrenal medulla through a nicotinic, uh, a nicotinic receptor to cause an endocrine response releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine. Okay, so cholinergic would be neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And we have an action potential that enters the synapse of a cholinergic neuron to open voltage-gated calcium channels. So voltage-gated calcium channels are going to be stimulated to open when an action potential arrives at the synaptic knob. Calcium is higher outside of the cell, so this is going to indicate that calcium will begin to enter the synaptic knob, and we are going to have vesicles that are being released, vesicles of acetylcholine that are released, and they make their way into the synapse, into the synaptic cleft. Now, the pool of vesicles They move to the membrane to release more acetylcholine. And the empty vesicles, the vesicles that have already released 
the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. They're going to go back up the axon just a short distance. to be refilled with more acetylcholine. <clears throat> the acetylcholine that's been released into the synaptic cleft binds to receptors in the post synaptic membrane. These receptors in the postsynaptic membrane are going to be ligand gated. And they'll also act as ion channels. And they are going to allow sodium to cross in and potassium to cross out. And this typically will be through the same channel here in the postsynaptic cell. The sodium is going to then begin to diffuse along the membrane. And as it diffuses along the membrane, so here's our membrane of the synapse, and here's that acetylcholine receptor, and sodium begins to flow in, and it diffuses along the membrane. And as it diffuses along the membrane, it depolarizes the intracellular fluid along the membrane. And as the fluid here along the membrane is depolarized, as the voltage changes, this forms a postsynaptic potential. So really, this action potential causing the release of acetylcholine acts as the stimulus, stimulus to generate a postsynaptic potential. We can also refer to this postsynaptic potential as the local potential for this postsynaptic cell. Now, if that sodium traveling away from those uh, receptors at the synapse, if that sodium travels and makes its way to the axon hillock where the trigger zone is, what do you think would happen? Hopefully you guessed that we would have the generation of an action potential. So we get the action potential generated. And we can go back towards the beginning of this lecture and recount all of the steps of action potential generation in this new tissue.